speak to me. Uh, good news, God speaks. He's a God of revelation. He has spoken. And uh, I hope the words of that song can be actually yours and mine. Uh, if you know him, you're saved to serve. Speak to me, Lord, I'm your servant. Speak to me, I'm listening. If you don't know him, welcome, glad you're here. And you can still say, Lord, speak to me, because he does that. So uh, why don't we just pause, and let's don't be hypocritical. Uh, but let's bow, and if you can say that, then do say that, Lord, speak to me. Oh, Lord, so thankful that you're a God who has spoken. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit takes your written word, the word of truth, and the spirit of truth speaks to our hearts. And we invite you right now to speak to us. We don't understand how that works, that a, the words of a mere man expounding your Bible, your word, your revelation, but you use it, you speak to us. So I don't want to be in the way. Uh, I want you, Lord, to speak to me and to each one in this room. And we invite you to do just that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can turn to Luke 11 in the Bible. If you didn't bring a Bible, we use the Bible. Uh, I'd encourage you to grab one there in the pew. Uh, I grabbed the one in front of me to find out what page it was on, and about half of it fell out. I think we need some new pew Bibles. <laughs> but, but anyway, it was still in there. You could find it. You might have a paperback. I don't know if yours falls apart. But uh, grab the Bible because we're, we're going to look at Luke 11 together, and uh, I want you to see the text. But before we do, I think I'll just uh, tell you where I'm going. Uh, as we say, Lord, speak to me. Uh, three things, really. Lord, speak to us regarding our enemy's power. We're going to look at Luke 11, and we're, we looked at it last time. We'll take a second look at it. Uh, we're going to see the enemy of our soul. And we want to learn his schemes. We don't want to be ignorant of his schemes. The Bible says don't be ignorant of his schemes, of his strength, of his power. So we want to see that. But we want to see also the stronger one, the strongest one. The one who has delivered, the one who has set us free, we want to see Christ. And we want to see his victory, his accomplished victory, if you will. <laughs> Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he's the liberator, the deliverer. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. We've already sung it, but we want to see that. The stronger one has arrived, and he is plundering the kingdom of Satan. And then third, I want to just, uh, you know, say, Lord, keep me. Keep me from my tendency to fall into a response to God's Word that is wholly inadequate. <laughs> and uh, in fact, our text, the page on my Bible, it lays out as a page almost, uh, front to top to bottom, you know. Uh, we're we're going to look at 20 through 32, but when I start at 14, I look at these responses, and there are five very common responses to God's Word to God's revelation of himself that are completely inadequate. 
even though they're so common. And they're common then and they're common now. Uh, keep me from that kind of inadequate, shallow marveling. Keep me from a deep-seated mistrust. We'll see. Keep me, oh Lord, keep me from asking for more evidence. <laughs> and keep me from thinking, like so many people think, that coming to Christ is just cleaning up your act, <laughs> reforming yourself, pulling yourself up by your booster. Be like Jesus. Go, go for it. <laughs> That's what a lot of people think we gather in this building for, kind of a pep rally, to go, like, you know, go for it. Go, go try to be like Jesus. That's not Christianity. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's a facsimile. It's, it's you know, Satan deals in truth twisted a little bit, but keep me from that, a mere reformation. And then, Lord, keep me from a less than shallow marveling. <laughs> or let me put it this way, less shallow marveling. Or if you're saying, what is he talking about? Well, just glance at verse 27. Because they marveled, you know, and then today we're going to see it came about while he said these things one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts of which you nursed. Wow! To be your mother. I would love to have my son turn out like yours. That would be so wonderful. And a lot of people marvel, less than shallow, at the reality of the, what they see in Christ or in Christ's followers. And but it kind of stays there. I'd like that, what you have. That, whoa, your mom, she must be very proud of you, this gal said, you know. And we often respond that way. It's less shallow, but it's still not the response the Lord's looking for. I was talking to a gal this week, and she said, and it was really neat what she said, because I could so relate to it, and I'll bet you can too. She said, about three months ago, <clears throat> That gnawing, that relentless, I wake up with it in the morning, she said. That ominous, just, I don't know if I can face the day kind of feeling that she wakes up with day after day, year after year. She said, about three months ago, it went away. She's met Christ. She said, it's gone. I wake up and it's not there. She said, I was looking for it. I said, don't. <laughs> she said, I've looked for it. I can't find it. And she said, I told a friend of mine about this. And she said, I want to be where you're at. Because who doesn't? And yet, to just get I'd like the fruit. I wish my kids would be like yours or that kind of thing. It's less shallow, but still, you don't just come to Christ for what he can give you. Now, that might draw you to him, but, well, we'll get into it. I just wanted to say where I'm going and what I'm going to say, so you can just go home now. <laughs> I preached the whole sermon. No. <laughs> That's my intro. Now. <laughs> no. <laughs> let's, let's look at the text, verse 20. Uh, remember the context. Jesus is doing what he did. He has set a man free from a demon that kept his mouth shut, kept his tongue dumb. He's liberating. He's saving. He's plundering, if you will. And they respond with crummy responses. You know, we've already detailed some of them. But I'm going to jump in at verse 20. Jesus said, If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own homestead, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, 
It passes through waterless places seeking rest and not finding any. It says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. And it came about while he said these things. One of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. And as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign. And yet no sign shall be given it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. And the Queen of the South shall rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them. Because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. I'll be honest with you. When I read that passage, starting really back at verse 14, uh, a few weeks ago, thinking about What's the big idea here? It seemed a little bit disjointed. But the more I've molded over and the more I've spent time in this page, in fact, this page has just been speaking to me, uh, I see a continuity here. And so I want to try to tie that together in your minds if I can. And, uh, you know, I want to just say that Jesus Christ claimed that his power is the power of God. Specifically, look at verse 20. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus knew his Bible. So did they oftentimes. And he said, if I cast out demons by the very finger of God. You remember Pharaoh? Moses and Pharaoh? They did. We should. Pharaoh had his domain. He had his slaves. And Moses was called to go and confront him. And you remember, I mentioned it briefly last week, but Pharaoh said to Moses, work a miracle. You come in here saying, let my people go. Why should I let your people go? Who is the Lord anyway? And I don't know him. If I did, I still wouldn't let him. You know, he, he talked that way. And he said, work a miracle. And so Moses threw his staff down, just like God told him to, and it became a snake. It became a serpent right there. And Pharaoh had his guys do the same thing. By the way, Satan is very real. We talked about it last time. Everything supernatural is not of God. Now, you get in dark places like Portland <laughs> or anywhere else. This world is his domain. And so everything supernatural, don't be wowed by it necessarily. But he said, work a miracle. And he said, Janus, Jambres, and they could do the same thing. And then Moses struck the Nile, it turned to blood, and the guys could do that. And even though it was self-destructive what Satan was doing, Mimicking the judgments of God, he could. And then he called out frogs, you remember? The third plague, or second plague, I should say. And uh, the magicians could do that. Then God said, and in all this, Pharaoh did not shama. He would not listen. In fact, it says that seven times. He wouldn't listen. My guys can do that. Well, then Moses and Aaron called forth gnats the third plague from God. And the magicians tried, and they could not. 
sidebar here. <laughs> Satan has power, but he has a limited power. <laughs> okay? And you get to the end of his power sooner or later. You'll never get to the end of the Almighty and his power. Well, anyway, they couldn't do it. And you know what they said? They said, Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh refused to listen or repent. It didn't bother him a bit. Jesus said, I do this by the very finger of God, the Spirit of God, Matthew tells us. And he backed it up. He backed it up. Verse 14, he just had done it. He'd set a man free. He is still backing it up. He sets free. He liberates. He releases. He heals. He changes lives. That's who he is. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. And then he stated point blank. Look at verse 23. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. There is no neutral ground. I announce that today, June, what is it? June 30th. You say, well, I haven't really made up my mind. I'm kind of hanging out in the middle. No, you're not. <laughs> there is no spiritual Switzerland. <laughs> I'm just going to watch, watch this unfold. No, you're, you're either with me, Jesus said, or you're against me. Whose side are you on? But I'll tell you what, sadly, even though Jesus Christ said it so clearly, then and now, many people try to stay on neutral ground. I'm not against, this is good for you guys. It helps you, that's wonderful. I, I, I believe in spirituality. You know, you know all the stuff that gets said. There's shallow marveling. There's deep-seated mistrust. You might be in the room and in that category. You might be saying, I can see what he's doing. But inside, you're, you have such a deep-seated mistrust that you think if you gave your life to Christ, he would mess it up. <laughs> You'd have to start going to church and be bored and dry and deaf. You know what? That's a lie. <laughs> He's the father of lies. He deals in lies. He keeps many people, even though they might give almost a cent to that Jesus is the Son of God, I don't want to give him my life because I don't want to get over, I'll just kind of, I'm not against him. You could be in any one of those categories. Or maybe you're asking for more evidence. Boy, I meet a lot of people that say that. If he'd just prove himself to me, I'd believe. Would you? Why is, it, why is this reluctance to come? to the liberator. Why this reluctance? Why is it that even me saying it, you can see in our culture, you can see in your own heart. I can see in my own heart. This reluctance to trust the only trustworthy one. This reluctance to come up with reasons to avoid the life-giving Savior, the deliverer. I believe, actually, that uh, this reluctance can be explained by a little phrase in the story Jesus told here. Remember the story, verse 21 and 22? When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own homestead, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he'd relied and distributes his plunder. Now, we talked about it last time. Jesus tells a very simple story to illustrate this. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his courtyard, his palace, his space, his territory, his possessions, here's the phrase, verse 21, his possessions are undisturbed. What he owns is at peace, literally. And we saw that Satan is the strong one. He's called the ruler of this world. He's the God of this age. And he owns people. That's his territory, the human heart. He's a usurper. He shouldn't, but he does. And people fancy themselves free. I do my own thing. And really, 
He's got you lock, stock, and barrel. His possessions are undisturbed. Now, in this whole page, we've seen there are some who are just messed up by Satan. Demonic, Satanism. We see it. You can see people that are just all messed up. And, you know, we saw it back in chapter 8. The guy cutting himself and no clothes and no home and living among the graveyard. And People watch movies to entertain themselves that way. You know, you can see the overt evil, but mostly he doesn't operate like a lion, just chewing up and gnawing and throwing and destroying. He does. Don't misunderstand me. He's a destroyer. But he is much more often pictured as what? A cunning serpent. He lies to us. He deceives. And he keeps people just hypnotized by his deceit, his seductions. He owns people through deception. Verse 21, he guards with all his tools, all his armor, his own possessions. And so he does not want you to listen to the Word of God. He does not want the people at your office to hear the Word of God. He wants them to be occupied with the words of man, with the words of stuff. He wants us to be... And you look around and you say, why is it that people won't come to Christ? Because many of them are at peace. Most of them. Undisturbed. Happy to just live and let live. Giving more energy to their retirement. Making sure they have enough, even when they need nursing care, right down to the end. Than to their eternity that looms. I said last week, it's like watching a game that's already over. And then pretending you haven't seen the... I always tell my wife, don't tell me the end, you know. And when I look on the thing, I I don't want to see the final score because I want to enjoy the game. But it would be stupid to be placing bets against the final outcome. And yet, many people are doing just that. They're living for... Maybe you. You're living, you're happy. You're living for popularity. And you've got a lot of friends, and people are pretty happy with how you are. And you think, to follow Christ, I don't want want to lose that. And you say, no, I'm happy with my life. And Jesus said, if you love your life, you'll lose it. If you hate your life, you'll gain it to eternal life. He called for this repentance, this whole change, this radical transformation. That's why Christianity isn't just trying to be like Jesus. Or just kind of making some adjustments as you walk down your self-willed life. No, coming to Christ is admitting you're a sinner. You're going the wrong way. And you hear the Word of God and you do it. You repent. Just like the people at Nineveh did. They repented. Just like the Queen of the South, she heard. I heard what you're saying, Solomon. And I've come to listen. And the Ninevites... They heard Jonah, and I got to think, the guy wasn't Billy Graham. (laughs) You know what I mean? He was the, it's interesting that Jonah is used (laughs) at all, isn't it? Because when God told him to go, he said, no way. I don't want them to believe. (laughs) I mean, you know, I'll tell you something much greater than Jonah is here. The Lord Jesus Christ has spoken Yet a lot of people are undisturbed. His possessions are under. He guards. He does not want people to hear. So he keeps them lulled to sleep. The Bible uses that picture often. And Ephesians 5 says, Awake, sleeper. Rise from the dead. He keeps us drunk, intoxicated, just happy with stuff, thinking, boy, if I could just get the vacation home, and I'd be happy. Well, I've known a few people with vacation homes. They're not happy, but I will be. (laughs) You know what it is like. I mean, I'm not against vacation homes. They're fun. But you know what I'm saying? This deception that he deals in, the strong man does. Uh, He keeps us, if possible, just procrastinating. 
We're not ignorant of his schemes, 2 Corinthians says. By the way, that 2 Corinthians 2, I think it's verse 11. We're not ignorant of his schemes, the way he thinks. And you know how mundane that one is? That's in the middle of a discussion about lack of forgiveness. <laughs> Satan just deals in, he doesn't deal necessarily with a pitchfork or with Satanism all the time, some. But many of us, he just keeps us bitter. Lack of forgiveness. Unwilling. That's the way he works. By the way, it's interesting that he said, we're not ignorant of his schemes, and he uses a word that means mindset or purpose or you know, his desire for us. We ought not be ignorant of that, and it could be as mundane as just keeping you unwilling to forgive. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm hanging on to it. Or in Ephesians 6, he says, put on the full armor of God that you might be able to stand firm against the schemes and he uses a different word, methodia. I think you hear it. Stand firm against his methods. Okay? So we talked about that, and, uh, but I want us to see it because, to me, it answers this question. Why are people so reluctant to come to the liberator? But then Jesus announces. Look at verse 22. Jesus said, when someone stronger than he attacks... And overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied, and he distributes his plunder. Jesus announces, I'm here. I just opened this guy's ears and tongue. I'm plundering the kingdom. The stronger has arrived. The Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty Revelation opens with. By the way, Revelation closes with. Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, not the stronger, really. Yes, the stronger, but the strong gust, almighty. And he came and he disarmed the rulers and authorities, Colossians 2.15. He has triumphed over them. The victory has been won. We know the final score. He came to Christ abolished death, Paul wrote to Timothy in his last letter, verse 10. Christ abolished death, and this victory that Christ has won is accomplished. And Jesus is announcing it and backing it up, and then he sent us out to announce it, and I tell you today, it is finished. Christ has conquered sin and death. He is indeed, like we sang, mighty to save, mighty to save. He will deliver you. He will distribute the plunder, if you will. Isaiah 53 said, therefore, because he poured out his soul to death, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will share the booty with the strong. He will change your life. He will give you life. The final scene has been written. We know the final outcome. Of who? Well, the strong one. <laughs> he's been defeated. Oh, you say he's still roaring around, deceiving like a serpent, roaring like a lion? I know. But in the big picture, God has told us. Luther wrote it in the hymn, Lo, his doom is sure. Go read Revelation 20. After this, when Jesus Christ returns, he's going to take Satan and chain him for a thousand years. And then, after the thousand-year millennium, he's going to release him for just momentarily, and then he's going to take him, and you can read about it. He's going to throw him into the bottomless pit, the lake of fire, where he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And he knows this. The demons, remember when Legion, when Jesus came, are you here to torment us before the time? They know. But it just makes them all the more vicious to try to take as many dupes with them as possible. Well, verse 24, we're not talking about just cleaning your life up. When, an, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. Notice it's not cast out of the man. It just goes out of the man. It's like sometimes Satan will retreat strategically. He maybe had you in the grips of some drug or 
alcohol or lust or something, and maybe you've been able to kind of break loose of that, and he'll just leave you alone for a while. Is that Christianity? Go to church. Clean your act up. Quit hanging around with those people. Hang around with these people. And you can kind of clean yourself up. And actually, you can see some liberation because the way life works, if you obey God's Word, there will be some good fruit from it. But if you don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, if He hasn't really caused you to be born again, you're just a sitting duck. And Satan will come back, notice, he says, and he says, hey, I'm going back to my house. It's still his house, notice. I'm going back to my house from where I came. And he goes back to his house, and he finds it clean and swept and easy to get and move into. And he brings seven <laughs> words. And, and the last state is worse than the first. Some of the hardest people are those who say to me, oh, I tried that for a while. I used to be into that, quite into that. They've turned back away, and Satan has a deeper grip than ever. By the way, sevenfold grip is pretty impressive, isn't it? But I will tell you, does, he ever, does that ring a bell with you? Mary Magdalene had been delivered from what? Seven demons. There is no case too hard for Christ. You say, Scott, I've kind of done that. I've made some reformations, and I've fallen away again. Maybe there's no hope for me. No, there's hope. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty. He can save. He is mighty to save. No matter what you've done, no matter how many times you've failed Him, if you really come to Him, you will be saved. We had a great devotional one morning over here Jeff shared with us. Uh, but I'll just say, and I won't try to re-give it, I'll just say, come, <laughs> stay. Just simple commands that Jesus gives, come to me and I'll give you rest. Abide, stay in me, and you'll bear much fruit. Jesus Christ is the liberator. Well, verse 27, it came about while he said these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. Let me just, uh, I've already commented on it, so let me just say this. It's a mistake to think that relationship with Christ is through physical lineage. Earlier we saw, I think it was chapter 8, when they said to Jesus, hey, your mom and your brothers are here. And he said, who's my mom and my brothers? Who's really related to me? In fact, look back there. Chapter 8, verse um, 21. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. To be rightly related to Christ is not being in the right family. The Jews were so good at this. We have our father Abraham. If Abraham's your father, how about you do the deeds of Abraham? Jesus would say. No, right relationship with God is not being born into the right church or the right family or, well, my, my folks believe that. I kind of believe that. No, no, it's more than that. Uh, and it, we would be remiss here, I think, to not see that there's this human tendency, verse 27, I'm back at this lady marveling, there's this human tendency to honor and exalt Mary. Mary. Blessed Mary. You say, Scott, would that really happen? Millions of people pray to her and stop short of coming to her son. Mariolatry is real. I mean, it's painful to say it, but it's so true. Now, on the contrary, Jesus said, blessed are those who hear the Word of God and do it, observe it. On the contrary, Blessed are those who really come to me, who repent, who hear what I'm saying and respond, who hear what I'm telling you to do and then do it. And we've seen this all the way through Luke. This isn't just Jesus. Oh, one day he told them they ought to hear and do. He was always saying this. 
He closed, look over at chapter 6. Remember the story he told about the two guys building the house? Verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts upon them, I'll show you whom he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when a flood rose and the river burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been built well. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house upon the ground without any foundation. And the river burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. In Matthew, he expands on that, but he used this metaphor often. And the point is so clear. He says, you, you've heard. Have you listened? Have you acted on it? Don't be like Pharaoh. Pharaoh heard, but he didn't listen. So he tells this woman, no, no, it's not, it's not that. Blessed are those who hear what I'm saying and respond. Well, verse 29, as the crowds were increasing, people started to really come. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign. By the way, uh, Jesus was a real crowd gatherer, wasn't he? As the crowds really started to come, he said, this generation is a wicked generation. <laughs> he was not afraid to speak the truth. Now, he spoke it in love. Don't misunderstand me here. But it's interesting to me that Jesus was not like this, taking polls. I wonder what people like today. What do they need? What are they saying they want? I'll give it to them. No, he knew what they need, and he gave us what we need. And so when the crowds were increasing is when he actually said something that is a little bit rough. In fact, he goes back to this matter of seeking more evidence. He's, it's a strong rebuke. He said, you know, it's wicked to ask for more evidence. Yet no sign will be given to it, this generation, but the sign of Jonah. <laughs> Let me announce it as clearly as I can. God gave his son. And God gave a sign. He raised him from the dead. Don't be saying, oh, if I just had more evidence. That's a wicked thing to say. God doesn't need to prove himself to you, and he already has. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. Every day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. No, God is non-trial. And Jesus came, the strong one, the strongest one, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities. Having triumphed over them through him, Colossians 2 says, he rose from the dead, never to die again. And Christians have been proclaiming ever since, and I announce to you today, Jesus Christ has risen. It won't be, well, we'll see someday. The game is over. It's final. <laughs> Jesus has conquered death in the grave. I was in the Home Depot parking lot. These thoughts were running through my mind, you know. And I'm singing it, one of those songs. I forgot which one now, but I was just singing it in my mind. And I said, it's not Easter, Scott. Why are you singing that? Well, because it's always Easter. <laughs> this is resurrection day. He did rise from the dead. We have victory. And I'll tell you what Jesus said. The sign of Jonah, and he takes Jonah and he applies it. He says, you know, Jonah was three days in that sea monster, but then he raised up. Well, that's the sign I'm going to give this generation, the only sign, really, the ultimate sign. And then, notice, he mentions the Queen of the South, too. And uh, I'll tell you what, I've mentioned it. Sign seeking is wicked. It's foolish. It's foolish, isn't it? Show us a sign. What had he just done? He liberated this guy. When he fed the 5,000 and they came and looking for another meal, remember that in John 6? He'd multiplied the food, and so they said, This is great, a gravy train. Let's go again. So they followed him around. And he said, you're seeking the food which perishes. 
You ought to seek the food which endures to eternal life. I'm the bread of life. And they said, well, then show us a sign. Show us a sign? Why were they following him? Because they knew he could turn bread into much bread, fish into much fish. He had proven himself. That's a smokescreen when people say that. Uh, by the way, notice too, I think I'd be remiss to not mention it. Jesus, when he was here, he took the hard places of the Bible, the places that the modern church might be tempted to be embarrassed about, and he stamped his approval on it. Jonah? Do you believe in Jonah? Jesus did. Noah? <laughs> he put all those animals in a big boat. I mean, do you believe that stuff, that mythology? Jesus did. We'll get to it in Luke 17. He said, just like the days of Noah, so it'll be before I get back. People will be saying, do you believe that stuff? They'll be mocking and laughing and scoffing. Adam and Eve, do you believe that? Jesus did. <laughs> when they asked him about marriage, he said, let's go back to the beginning. Adam and Eve, remember that? <laughs> and he quoted from Genesis 1 and 2. Now, our Lord uh, isn't embarrassed you know, the places where God really showed himself mighty are kind of like segments in the Old Testament. You've got the creation, you've got the flood, you've got Moses in front of Pharaoh, and Jesus was often referring to that. He said, remember at the burning bush, when he revealed himself to Moses, he said, I'm the God of the living, not the dead. And you've got Elijah and Elisha. There was a bunch of miracles clustered around them. And Jesus started his ministry in Luke 4 by saying, it's just like Elijah's day. Now, Jesus, very subject to the Word of God, if I can say it that way. He wrote it, and he honors it. And he said, you know, I'm not here to change it at all. And we don't need to be embarrassed. We know which side we're on. We're on the victor side. And heaven and earth will pass away. The Word of God will not. And I encourage you, you'll never be disappointed trusting his word. Well, they've got, they've got Moses and the prophets, Jesus told. Remember that story in Luke 16? We'll get there. And he said, oh, they won't believe that. But if somebody go back from the dead, remember? And Jesus said, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, if you won't believe God's word, you won't even believe if someone rises from the dead. And he did. And people say, well, show us more proof. Oh, I plead with you today. Know your enemy. Praise God he's defeated. Know your Savior. Enjoy that he is the plunderer. He sets free. He deals in life and liberty and joy. Trusting him will not mean that he'll plunder you. That's a lie. That's a deep-seated mistrust that we need to get rid of. And don't ask him for more proof in your life. He's given you all you need. He gave himself. Enjoy him, Christian. Worship him. Abandon yourself to him. Hear what he says and then do it. When he says to go out and proclaim this gospel, to go out and feed the poor, to heal the sick, to bring the message, the balm of Christ to this world, Put feet to it. Obey it. That's the blessing, he says. Hear and do my word. And if you're here without Christ, oh, I plead with you. God gave his son. And God gave a sign. He raised him from the dead. You will never regret trusting in him hearing his voice, turning in repentance. The Ninevites repented. The queen of the south heard. And I'll tell you something much wiser than Solomon is here, much greater than Jonah, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Father, we praise you for your